According to the FBI, this is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in US history. Not only because it's the only successful skyjacking in America, but because it's one of the most studied crimes ever. Hi folks, my name's Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. Join me now as we dive into a legendary skyjacking and ask, who was D.B. Cooper? On the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, a smartly dressed, middle-aged man carrying a dark-coloured briefcase walked into Portland International Airport and purchased a $20 one-way ticket to Seattle, Washington. He'd be flying Northwest Airlines aboard Flight 305. That man would come to be known as Dan Cooper. Cooper boarded the plane along with 36 passengers and sat in seat 18C, which was the middle seat in the back row. Once he took his seat and got comfortable, he calmly ordered a bourbon and soda. Shortly after takeoff, around 3 p.m., Cooper passed a handwritten note to the flight attendant, Florence Schaffner. She took the note from him and with disregard placed it in her pocket. As she was about to turn and walk away, Cooper regained her attention by saying, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. He then ordered Schaffner to sit next to him as he slid his briefcase up onto his lap, clicking it open to reveal several sticks of dynamite attached to a timer. Yep, that's your stereotypical bomb, all right. He then instructed her to write down what he was about to tell her. He told her that he wanted $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash and in $20 bills. He demanded four parachutes consisting of two primary chutes and two secondary chutes. He also said by the time they land in Seattle that he wants a fuel truck ready and waiting. He finished by saying, no funny stuff or I'll do the job. Schaffner proceeded down the aeroplane towards the cockpit to inform the captain and the crew of this developing situation. Meanwhile, another crew member, Tina Mucklow, remained by Cooper's side at his request. Using the telephone situated at the rear of the plane, she was able to communicate on Cooper's behalf with the cockpit and the other members of the crew. Flight 305 was instructed to hold a circular flight pattern in the skies above Seattle Tacoma Airport, whilst the authorities retrieved the items that Cooper demanded. The cash, which consisted of $10,020 bills and four parachutes, which were being brought in from a local flight school. 90 minutes later, the plane landed and Cooper released all 36 passengers and some of the crew in exchange for the money and the parachutes. That was really nice of him, wasn't it? Hmm. After takeoff, Cooper requested that the next destination be Mexico City and that the plane stay below 10,000 feet. He also instructed the cockpit to fly with the landing gear down, the flaps at 15 degrees, the cabin lights were to be dimmed and the aft staircase was to be released and left in the down position. Aft just means the back of the plane. Two of his demands were impossible to meet. First of all, they could not continue non-stop to Mexico City. So after some deliberation, it was agreed that they would stop at Reno, Nevada for refueling before progressing on to the requested destination. It was also not possible to take off with the rear staircase deployed, so Cooper agreed to it being closed on the condition that Mucklow stay with him at all times and instruct him on how to operate the staircase once they were in the air. Two hours later, the plane successfully took off from Seattle and they were airborne by 7.36 p.m. Approximately five minutes after takeoff, Cooper ordered Mucklow to go to the cockpit and tell them that he wishes not to be disturbed. I mean, he was probably counting his cash. Mucklow did as she was requested and approximately three hours later, Flight 305 safely landed in Reno without further incident. Once the plane was safely on the runway, the crew emerged from the cockpit to find no sign of Cooper or the briefcase containing the bomb. Further inspection revealed that the aft staircase had been lowered during the flight. Aft means at the back of the plane, in case you were wondering. It was abundantly obvious that at some point during the flight, Dan Cooper stood up from his seat and entered the aisle. He put on his shades, strapped on his parachute, made his way to the rear of the plane and jumped, vanishing into the night sky. When he got on a plane in Portland, Oregon last night, he was just another passenger. But today, after hijacking a Northwest Airlines jet, description on one wire service, master criminal. The FBI soon stormed the plane, and although the circumstances of this incredible hijacking and subsequent escape were unbelievable enough, what was even more perplexing was the sheer lack of physical evidence. 
What they did find was a black clip-on tie, eight cigarette butts and two of the four parachutes Cooper had requested. Subsequent interviews with the crew revealed a detailed description of Cooper and several composite sketches were then created. No one witnessed Cooper jumping from the plane, none of the crew or pilots, but even more strange was neither did the two fighter jets that were escorting the plane. Of course it was night time, but I still would have thought experienced fighter pilots would notice someone lowering the aft stairs and jumping from a commercial plane. Aft means the back. At 8.05pm, the crew contacted Cooper by intercom to ask if there was anything else they could do for him. Cooper replied, but declined the offer. Approximately 10 minutes later, the entire crew experienced a shuddering and brief shaking of the cabin, which they believe could have been the moment Cooper lowered the stairs and jumped. Prior to the flight leaving Seattle, Cooper was naturally agitated at the two-hour refuel time. As such, when the captain proposed a suggested flight plan to Cooper, this was rejected, with Cooper exclaiming, just get the show on the road. The captain opted to select a flight plan called Victor 23, which would take them to Reno by flying directly over the airspace above Portland, Oregon. This information would be crucial in the investigation. Given the flight time, Victor 23's flight path and the estimated time of Cooper's departure, the FBI was able to narrow down a rough landing zone around 25 miles north of Portland. At first light, the manhunt was on. The federal authorities launched an almighty search campaign at the supposed land site and surrounding areas. However, this task would prove almost impossible, firstly due to the crazy uneven terrain which would be a nightmare to try and search, but the heavy forested area would be subjected to the harshest winter weather. Over the next few weeks, gale force winds and heavy rainstorms would make the area most unhospitable and would therefore make the task like finding a needle in a haystack, if the haystack was made of needles on needle planet. There's really only one thing left to do. Follow the money. So almost one month later, with not much more to go on, the FBI turned their attention to the money. At the time, banks across America had set up ransom packages. These packages were set up for such an occasion. As such, the $10,020 bills that had been given to Cooper contained sequential serial numbers. These serial numbers were then distributed to various financial institutions, as well as printed in newspapers and shown on news broadcasts, with the goal of making it almost impossible for Cooper to actually spend any of the money. They had even issued a reward for anyone who came into contact with any of the bills. The case would again go cold. That was until almost a decade later, in February of 1980. A young boy who was playing on the beach in South Washington uncovered three bundles of cash, which totaled $5,880. By this point, almost everyone in America knew of the infamous Sky Pirate case. So when the wee boy ran home with delight to show his parents his findings, they quickly contacted authorities, and lo and behold, the serial numbers were a match. This just added to the mystery though, as the section of beach that the young kid was playing on was 16 miles away from the initial speculated drop zone. The fact that three bundles of ransom cash found its way to the beach, still intact with rubber bands holding them together, means that they didn't fall from the sky or float down the river. They were buried there by either Cooper himself or someone else. In the last 41 years, the drop zone, the beach and all the surrounding areas in between have been thoroughly searched. And so far, Dan Cooper's remains or any more money have gone undiscovered. So let's think about another important part of the story, the jump. Imagine, you're standing at the rear of a plane, 10,000 feet up, the stairs are lowered and below your feet whipping past at deafening speed is the frigid cold clouds of a dark night sky, making it impossible to see any terrain, landmarks or lights below. You're holding the briefcase that you boarded with, which by the way contains a supposed bomb, a large bag with the $200,000 in cash and not one, but two parachutes. Oh why? and you're only wearing a raincoat. So given all that, we can see why it was widely assumed that Mr. Cooper didn't survive the jump. Tina Mucklow, the flight attendant, said that Cooper seemed completely familiar with the parachutes given to him. She even offered him a paper sheet with instructions on how to jump, which he waved away saying that he didn't need it. So as we will no doubt discuss later, either Cooper was super smart or super dumb. And here's why the two have been debated. First off, a smart move was that Cooper retained the handwritten note that he had given to Schaffner, 
meaning the only documented example of his handwriting was where he signed the plane ticket. So why did Cooper demand four parachutes? Two primary and two secondary? Well, because maybe he thought that the FBI would tamper with them. In which case, he was bang on the money, because that's exactly what they were going to do. But when he requested the four parachutes, this prevented them from tampering with any of them, as they believed that he could be jumping with one or more hostages. Smart play. Or was it? In a rush to get the four chutes from the flight school to the tarmac in time for the plane landing, the FBI inadvertently collected a dummy chute, which would be non-functioning and used for training purposes. Remarkably, Cooper took the dummy chute with him, as well as a functioning primary chute. But even more remarkable was the fact that of the two primary chutes supplied, he had taken the older style one. All of this would give investigators a wee hint as to the type of man they were hunting. See, the primary chute that he ultimately chose was an older military style chute, whereas the one he opted not to take was a civilian luxury chute, indicating that Cooper may have a military background. This was reinforced by the fact that when the plane was near landing in Seattle, he had mentioned to the cabin crew that McCord Air Force Base was only 20 minutes away from Seattle Tacoma Airport. Flight 305 was also a particular type of plane, a Boeing 727. The Boeing 727 was used for covert ops during the Vietnam War in order to drop CIA agents into the country covertly. Guess why they chose that plane? Go on. Yes, because it was the only plane of that size that had that particular style of aft staircase that drops down. Could Dan Cooper have been a CIA operative? So where did the name D.B. Cooper come from? On his plane ticket, he signed the name Dan Cooper. At no point was the initials D.B. Cooper ever written or uttered. So why has he always been known as D.B.? I mean, the newspapers called him D.B. Cooper. And we all know that newspapers and mainstream media never get anything wrong, right? Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all week. This all came about because the FBI tracked down a Portland man called D.B. Cooper, who was discovered not to be the hijacker. And, well, the papers just ran with it. Mental. But here's one for you. Dan Cooper clearly isn't his real name either. But check this out. Dan Cooper is a comic book character, and I'm going to show you a picture of him right now. Are you ready? <claps> Boom. Holy Roger, Ramjet Batman. This comic was widely popular with French-speaking Canadians at the time. Could Cooper have been a Canadian? Right, enough of all that. Let's get a look at these suspects. Robert Rackstraw first came to the fore as a suspect in 1978. He had a lengthy criminal record and was an experienced helicopter pilot and paratrooper with a military background. He had experience with explosives. It's also of note that he had an uncle by the name of John Cooper, who was also an experienced skydiver. And Rackstraw was discharged from the army only months prior to the hijacking, which could point to a possible motive. When Rackstraw was confronted by the media about the possibility of him being Cooper, he merely answered by saying, I could have been. It's him, no doubt about it. Look at the evidence, it's him. However, certain details would point at him not being Cooper. For example, he had the wrong eye colour, as our Cooper had brown eyes, and Rackstraw did not. Also, Rackstraw was only 28 years old at the time of the hijacking, whereas Cooper was in his 40s. Kenneth Christensen became a suspect in 2003. Although he passed away in 1994, this was thanks to his brother drawing conclusions that there were far too many similarities between Kenneth and Cooper. He was 45 years old and had an extensive military background. He worked for Northwest Airlines, both before and after the hijacking. Shortly before his passing, he confided in his brother, there's something you should know, but I cannot tell you. It was later discovered by the family that unbeknownst to them, he had a little over $200,000 in cash squirreled away in a bank account. To further convince investigators that this could be our Cooper, flight attendant Florence Schaffner had stated that Christensen bore a striking resemblance to that of Dan Cooper. Hang on, actually, no, this this is the guy, no doubt. I mean, I mean, look at him, it's him for sure. I've never been more sure of anything. It was discovered that there were a few physical differences between Christensen and Cooper, like height, weight, hair, etc. After investigation, it was also revealed that the large amount of money in his bank accounts were confirmed to be proceeds of him selling land. Richard McCoy Jr. first became a suspect in 1972. Why? Ah, no reason. No reason, really. Oh, wait. Yeah, he hijacked a Boeing 727. And he escaped. Guess how? By jumping from the aft staircase. Aft just means at the back of the plane, by the way. He used a fake name. He used an explosive device to gain his demands. He used handwritten notes. 
and used the phrase, no funny stuff, when addressing the crew. He demanded half a million dollars and four parachutes. He then proceeded to jump from the rear of the plane just like Cooper. McCoy survived the jump and was able to evade authorities for two days. He was arrested and sentenced to 45 years in prison. He would later die in 1974, the entire time neither denying nor confirming that he was Dan Cooper. Nah. Now wait. This is the guy. It's definitely him. Case closed. Case closed, folks. We've got him. Good job, everybody. That's him. On the other hand, he was an experienced skydiver, whilst it's widely believed that our Cooper was not. He had a specific flight path. He used a hand grenade instead of a bomb, and also had an unloaded firearm, which he used to intimidate the crew. He failed to reclaim the handwritten notes that he used for his demands. He was only 29 years old in 1971, and finally, when Schaffner and Mucklow and the other crew were shown his photograph, they all said it didn't look like Cooper. It's widely believed that McCoy was simply a copycat, and that he was heavily influenced by Cooper's original hijacking. Hey, it worked for him, right? Let's give it a go. Right, before we talk about the next suspect, I want to show you this first. This is a speculative sketch of Cooper done in 1999, projecting what he may have looked like at that time. In 2018, the Cooper train stopped at William Smith. He had served in World War II and had experience in parachuting. He was 43 years old in 1971, he had dark brown eyes, and he matched the physical description of Cooper. In 1970, so one year prior to the hijacking, the company that he was working for went bankrupt, and as such, he lost everything, including his pension. Now let's have another wee look and compare the composite sketch with his foe. He was a yard master for the railroads. The tie that was recovered from Cooper was later examined by an electron microscope, which uncovered certain metallic particles, which would normally have no place in such an item. These particles were pure titanium and were very rare in 1971. The feds had believed that Cooper may have been part of a metal fabrication plant or facility, or a rail yard. A friend of Smith's, from high school who died in the war was called Daniel Cooper. <laughs> right? Dwayne Webber came to the Fed's attention in 1995, when shortly before his death he confessed to his wife Jo, I've got a secret to tell you, I'm Dan Cooper. Webber's wife recounted some striking similarities. She claimed that he owned a bank bag, the same type that the money was given in. He injured his knee whilst performing a risky jump from a plane. He once awoke from a nightmare he had about leaving his fingerprints on the aft stairs. Aft just means... Ugh, never mind. He visited the same beach where the money was found in 1979. He had a military background. He had a criminal record. He matched the physical description and he was 47 years old in 1971. Right, come on. It's him. 100% it's him, right? It's got to be. Of the 66 fingerprints taken from on and around C-18C, which Cooper was sat in, none of them matched Weber. However, it cannot be confirmed that any of them were Cooper's either. The DNA sample taken from the tie pin also didn't match that of Weber's. But again, it's unclear if the sample taken even belonged to our Cooper. A funny thing about DNA. Remember there were eight cigarette butts recovered, which surely was saturated by Dan Cooper's DNA. Well, strangely enough, that DNA evidence was lost and has not turned up since. This story is like something from a heist movie. But besides it being one of the greatest unsolved hijackings in history, it had a profound effect on civil aviation as a whole. Unfortunately, it takes an event like this hijacking, some other crime or an act of terrorism, to bring around change. For example, in the year after Cooper's 1971 hijacking, there were 19 similar hijackings and ransom attempts in what was later dubbed the Golden Age of Hijacking. In 1973, the Federal Aviation Authority, or FAA, rolled out the requirement that all airlines must search passenger bags. Among the other changes were the mandatory inclusion of peepholes in the cockpit doors. I can see you. Honestly though, of all the suspects that we've mentioned, the one that seems the most likely, for me at least, is William Smith. The evidence and lack of contradicting facts would make him the prime suspect in my opinion. However, saying that, these are only a small selection of suspects and more than likely, the real D.B. Cooper got away with it or splatted into the ground at over 200 miles per hour, in which case none of this matters. Thank you ever so much for spending the time with me during this video. This was an insane one to research, but crazy fun to work on. Wherever you are in the world, and whatever you're doing, I genuinely wish you well and hope you keep smiling. Take care, and I'll see you in my next video.